So, the year is 2009, that's the last year for which we have complete data. I'm using that market exchange rate, again, that's the market that you and I can trade our currencies at uh, in order to uh, engage in some sort of trade exchange. These are the top 10 economies. What I want you to see is the top 10 economies uh, in 2009 contributed roughly two-thirds, 67%, roughly two-thirds of global GDP. By the way, if I put up the numbers for 1959, the number is 68%. If I put up the numbers for 1979, the number is 68%. It's a pretty stable number. I'll show you some of those historic things in a moment. Um, the top 10 there. Uh, among the largest economies, the North Atlantic uh, stands out. Which, between the United States on one hand and the European Union on another, I have well over 50% of global GDP. That has been true for the last 30 years. Um, but what I want you to also see is that you have some major players in Asia, Japan and China, and collectively together, Japan and China represent something uh, under 20% of, of, global, of global GDP. Um, what you would also, by the way, know if you've been paying attention this year is that China has probably passed Japan in all likelihood to be that world's second largest economy, um, basically using any exchange rate, no less, the, uh, no less this one. But what I want you to also see is the heavy concentration of Europe among that top ten. And what I want you to also see is Brazil. We talk about the BRICS all the time. Brazil. Russia, India, and China. Of those four economies, the only one that has consistently been in the top 10 for the last 30 years is Brazil. Is Brazil. It is Brazil and its uh, uh, mining and ma mining industries. It is Brazil and its manufacturing industries. If you fly a regional jet on this planet, uh, two-thirds probability that is made by Embraer. Embraer is based in Brazil. So we have a phenomenal manufacturing presence, even in industries such as aerospace, where there are very high barriers to entry. Um, on the one hand, we, uh, we, are, so we, 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 we are a major source of supply of manufactured goods. We're a major source of supply on extractive products, agricultural products, etc. Brazil has been a major beneficiary not only of its own growth, the growth of its own demand, but it has been a major beneficiary of the growth of everybody else on this chart. After all, where does China get the natural resources required for its steel and other industries? Brazil is a likely uh, source of supply. Where does China supply food uh, in excess of what it can produce itself? Brazil is a major source of supply. So Brazil has a, figures consistently and prominently on this list of top 10. The other one that drops on and off, of course, is Russia. Now, Russia occasionally goes through a name change. Uh, it was on the chart when it was the Soviet Union. Uh, of course, then it was slightly larger than it is in, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the current borders of, of, of Russia. But Russia bounces on and off this chart in large measure because it has a large extractive sector, most notably in energy and minerals, and is highly dependent on global prices for those. And as a result, it both is a beneficiary and a victim of the volatility in those prices. And it just so happens that in 2009, Russia happened to appear on the appear on this uh, on this uh, on this chart. Um, and Russia is that second uh, uh, economy that over the last 30 years you would have seen among the Brazil, Russia's, India, and China. My point here is that it is the Asian com contingent within Brazil, Russia, India, and China, meaning China and India, that are the newcomers to the top 10. Uh, China quite successfully joining it in the, in the late uh, 1990s. Uh, and India, as I'll show you in a second, likely to join relatively soon. In fact, why don't I just sort of uh, flip to, to that. But what I want you to understand when we're looking at these charts is how phenomenally stable these numbers are until the economic crisis of 2008. So what I've done is I've taken the actual numbers of 2006 and 2009 
I've uh, taken the IMF's projections for, for 2012. Uh, what I want you to see is that uh, the top 10 consistently uh, generate about two-thirds of global, of global wealth. It has been phenomenally stable, just taking back to 2006. Uh, you can see that we might change who the relative ranking of any one of the top 10, but the names are all generally the same. Um, the, uh, as a rule of thumb, since the, night, since the late 1950, uh, the top 10 changes by one country every 10 years, as a rule of thumb. So your predictive capabilities, 10 of, as who's going to be on the top 10 10 years from now, is 90%. Your dog could make these predictions, should you not want to. So you have, it's the power of incumbency. It's very common when I'm in Asia to have everyone talk about growth rates. It's, it's a little bit like uh, I often do in my consulting practice, I work with companies. And there's a very interesting thing that you observe when people are making presentations about investment opportunities. If I want to, if I'm relatively small in absolute terms, but want to attract your attention about the opportunity in the future, I focus on growth rates. So we go from one to two, that's 100% growth, <coughs> but I've only grown one unit. Um, so that, I focus on growth rates. But the point is that the power of incumbency is, is that I can take a $14 trillion economy, such as the United States, I can grow a mere one or 2%, but I can kick off more cash growing that 1% or 2% than the economies 11 through 20 combined kick off. The power of incumbency, the sheer fact that already large economies are likely to be successful, at least by this measure, successful in terms of the absolute amount of wealth they create simply because we did it last year. We have a very high probability of doing it next year. But what I want you to see is that, at least during this crisis, this economic crisis of 2008, a major change is occurring. Just go from 2009 to 2012. You'll see, of course, India finally joins the chart. You'll see Russia, which has been teeter-tottering between 9 and 10, moves up on that chart. For the first time, we now have three economies in Asia. The combined value of those three economies, measured in market terms, uh, equals basically that of the United States. Comes close to equaling that of the European Union. That is likely to be a major shift in Asia's relative position in the global economy. And, but in a historical perspective, it is unprecedented. We have not seen that in the past. Despite all the massive technological change that's occurred since 1950, despite all the other uh, geopolitical changes that have occurred, on average, every decade, one country falls out and another country gets added in to the top 10 economies. It's a phenomenally stable number. One of the ironies of globalization, perhaps one of the contradictions of globalization, is that the greater and greater we found pressures for the geographic dispersion of value-added activities, there's been a corresponding centripetal force that has meant that assets, capabilities, competencies, and ultimately wealth is at the same time also very geographically concentrated. Very geographically concentrated. Change has occurred, but change has occurred in very specific locations at very key points in time. And we are probably at one of those inflection points, that recession of 2008, that will lead to a major change in the global economy. Now I'm going to change exchange rates on you. Remember here I'm looking at market rates. I'm now going to switch to those PPP rates, those sort of notional rates that sort of suggest what value a dollar can buy for you uh, in, any given, in any given economy. And what you're going to see is those PPP rates were already telling us that India will eventually join this top 10. Think of the PPP rates as being an early warning indicator of major changes that are likely to occur a decade or so further out because those exchange rates will in fact begin to approach those PPP rates if indeed governments get out of the way uh, to what otherwise might be compelling market forces. So let's change it to those PPP rates. Let's look at the same year 2009. 
And what I want you to see is a very different ranking. So if you were Thomas Friedman and you were going to write a book entitled The World is Flat, it's this chart you're going to focus on. It's going to prove your point. You'll see that India, which was barely joining the top 10 perhaps by 2012, looking only at market rates, now India, if we use this different exchange rate that really captures the value created by all that engineering and other talent in India, you'll see that India is an economy that's nearly the size of Japan using this PPP rate. And if I add India, Japan, and China, three of the top four, you'll see that now I have uh, uh, economies that are generating 23, 24% of global GDP, far in excess of the United States, far in excess of the European Union. A very, 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 very different story is at work here. Why that's a different story? These are economies, most notably China and India, that have very consciously, up until very recently, suppressed their currencies at the market rates you and I can charge, but they have grown so rapidly internally and have generated uh, value internally that really is worth far more to the global economy than the market rate would suggest. That's what that PPP rate is trying to capture. What exactly is being created inside, independent of, 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 of what we're able to change our money at, at, at a bank or at um, uh, or at, at a hotel. What I want you to also see is that the top 10 economies measured using this PPP rate are a much smaller portion of the global GDP. They're not that two thirds, it's 60. In fact, if you look at projections going forward, that same IMF work that I pointed to earlier, the IMF projection for 2012 at least is that these top 10 will be somewhere in the 57, 58% of global GDP, not the 67% of global GDP, which has been a pretty constant uh, figure over the, last, uh, over the last 30 years. Again, measured in PPP terms, we may be seeing a major shift in Asia's relative position in the global economy. Now, I want to drop down below the top 10. Who do you guess is in the next 10? In other words, numbers 11 to 20. Just ponder that for a moment. You don't need to yell it out. Uh, uh, just ponder that for a moment and see on this next chart, what matters on this next chart is not only what you, the dog that barks, the things you see, but the dog that doesn't bark. You know, if you read any Sherlock Holmes novels, you'll discover that the dog that barks can be a very important clue to the case, and the dog that doesn't bark also tells you something as well. So the things you see, uh, and do in fact have confirmed the things you expected to see but don't see on this chart. Now I've paused long enough. You've got at least some names of countries on your, on your mind. And here we go. Now I'm assuming that every one of you thought that Mexico was number 11. Uh, I assume that was just what was happening. I, I would, if I go around the room, Mexico was the first time. Mexico is to the United States what Turkey, number 16, is to the European Union. That major source of engineering and manufacturing talent serving markets. One of the interesting features of globalization is that globalization, uh, in one indicator of globalization is when your largest trading partners are your neighbors. Right? Uh, who, who do you think are the US's two largest trading partners? Hint. You have to have a visible border with the United States. Now, there are four countries that have uh, a border with the United States. One is Bermuda. I want to rule that out for a moment. Uh, another one, Governor Palin will remind you, is Russia. She was governor of, of Alaska and was protecting the United States, allegedly, uh, she would claim, from uh, transgressions on that side. Let's rule out Russia for a moment. That leads two other countries, Mexico, in Canada. Between the two of them, I have well over 50% of US trade on any given year. Between the two of them and the United States, 